Okay, hello, I'm Kathy Honeyman. I'm, I'm glad to be with you today. And I just would like, like to introduce you to my family. Um, I have a 27-year-old uh, uh, daughter with intellectual disabilities, and I also have a 25-year-old son. So, but what I really wanna do is I wanna invite you to a party. Um, imagine yourself going to a party and uh, you walk into the room and maybe you know a couple of people there, you're a little bit uncomfortable, uh, and you sort of, you know, you're sort of checking out the room, you're checking out different people that are there, different clusters of people, and you start thinking, okay, now where do I really fit in? Where, where am I feeling comfortable? Which are, is anyone sort of giving me the nod that, yes, join our little cluster? Or are people looking off, you know, and basically maybe they're in a in very intensive kind of conversation, so I sort of know not to get into it. And uh, so finally, I'll probably land up in some group where, I, where I'm going to be looking for warm and friendly people. So, um, and they will gesture to me to join their group. Now, picture a person with intellectual disability. Looks very different. They walk into a room, and just like me, they're also a little bit uncomfortable. But they may walk right into the first group that they see and just sort of get in there and maybe start talking about their favorite hobby, which is fossils. <laughs> and they don't stop talking about it. So how do you think that that's gonna land on that group that they're with? And, uh, and what we're talking about today is a lot about social skills and social uh, cues and being able to read that. It's very, very important. And persons with intellectual disabilities really have a hard time with that. So we're gonna do a couple of things. First, we'll talk about why it's so important to have a friend. We're going to talk a little bit more about a little bit about social cognition and how that affects you. Also, a group model that I put different things together and came up with. And then throughout the presentations, different strategies that you could use to help the person um, better be able to read social cues and to get into relationships. So what is friends? And, and really, how do you even make friends? Or what's so important about having a friend? Uh, well, the basis of friendship, or a lot of it, is if I can make you or help you to feel comfortable and happy to be with me, then you're probably going to want to see me again. So, and it's not really so much about my, um, whether I, have to, I agree with you or I don't agree with you on certain things. Uh, it's more about when you walk away from me, you're saying, hey, I really enjoyed being with her. So having a friendship is a lot about feeling cared about, being respected, and uh, feeling that somebody really enjoys being with, you, being with you. So, but what does it matter? Well, studies show that, uh, that friendship really matters to a lot of, um, with regard to your emotional health, your physical health, um, and you even live longer, which is, you know, surprises a lot of people. So it's really, really important. Um, also, friendships could lead to different job opportunities. Uh, you can meet with someone and you never know who they know. And if you want a job, they may be able to uh, network and, and help you out with that. Also, uh, community protection. And something that people don't really think about a lot, which is if, um, well, for example, I had a friend of mine who her daughter lived in, an, in, a, um, in a supported living type environment. Every week, the daughter and her provider would go to the bank. And uh, then, but it just happened to the teller that they went to, the teller knew this woman's mother. And uh, what happened was the uh, provider was being very nasty and very demeaning to her daughter. Well, that information got back to the mother. And of course, that was probably the end of that placement. So you never really know. There's a, it, with more people, with more eyes on you, uh, it uh, makes for uh, a safer life. Um, now, so how about without friendships? Well, there you get into uh, a lot more, more people, you know, feel loneliness from that and experience loneliness. And then, you know, you, you start to see a lot of depression that comes out of it, even an impaired immune functioning system and a lot of stress. So friendship is vital. Uh, and um, there is the Maslow's hierarchy of needs scale, where he literally puts social needs at the very middle middle of it. And these are what we're calling really needs. These are, this, is, this is what people you know really need is the feeling of belonging, 
uh, feeling that they're loved, and it's essential, really, to, uh, to your life. So what actually is happening? Um, in the last 20 years, we've had a lot of different community programs that are inclusive, some not inclusive, but, uh, but there's really been a, 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 an enormous amount of stuff in the community that's happening for persons with special needs. So, but how is it that with all of that going on, that a person with special needs still has a hard time developing friendships in the broader community? And my thought, my theory on that is, is that it's more about their ability to uh, not just socialize, but their ability to really pick up on, on social cues, to be able to read other people, to understand who they're talking to. Um, and what I like to do is to work with people to not to change their personality because their personalities are as wonderful as anyone else's are, uh, but to help them be able to observe their environment, to be able to observe what, or maybe even take some guesses about what another person is thinking. Um, now, if you don't do that, if you don't address this particular issue, uh, you really do them no, there's no service that you're doing them. And um, so it's, it's um, and the other thing is that they also know that, that something uh, is not going right. Uh, because they're, they go to social functions, they're, they're ignored, um, and, or people get angry at them, and they really don't know why. So it's really not a good service to, to ignore that. So what gets in the way? Well, they have lots of, lots of different difficulties. One of them is just in uh, communicating itself. Um, lots of uh, also problems as far as like few opportunities to meet other people, if, especially if they're living in a group home. And um, uh, what, I, what, what this uh, presentation is really focusing on is their uh, lack of the, the knowledge to be able to socialize. So what I'm looking at is you really need to have a two-prong approach, which is the community uh, offering different programs to people uh, on the greater uh, spectrum, but also uh, having a one-on-one -on -one working with the individual with regard to their being able to read their environment better. So uh, different things the community can do. Well, you could, we can always continue to increase opportunities so that they meet people. Uh, we can even like include a relationship factor in their ISP, their individual support plan. For example, if a person wants to lose weight, well, uh, why not, can we in some way uh, fit a social um, you know, element in there? Maybe they can join Weight Watchers and they can do it with other people. So being you know, creative and trying to connect them with the community in ways that also foster friendship. Now, in the community, there's four different natural support strategies that are out there. Uh, one of them is Circle of Friends. Circle of Friends is a terrific um, uh, concept. And what that is is that they, the, uh, usually it's for a person who's still living at home. And there will be um, a parent will usually get maybe relatives, next door neighbors, or maybe a coworker, and they sort of surround the individual with uh, contacts. So they are going to be helping to support that individual's goals. And with maybe you know if the individual wants to um, uh, get a job, maybe one of them you know has a contact with that. So it's very very supportive. Another one is peer-based support. Now these are really. Um, Persons uh, usually with shared disabilities, and uh, they, you know, the the ARC, for example, does an awful lot of uh, peer support type things where people come together and they go to and they and it's more of like an, of an advocacy effort. And another is the befriending strategies. A again, the ARC offers a program called Community Connections, and with that they um, will have a person, a non-disabled person, paired up with a person with disabilities, and they just become friends. And they you know, meet up for coffee, whatever, uh, dinner, movies, and they do that on a regular basis. Now the last one is a skills, uh, social skills program, and that's really where we're, where we're going to today. But just as a little a tiny bit of background, um, is that we always want to think about, well, what is the motivation here? What, why would someone want to change their, their, um, uh, how they're interacting with others? And the first one is really external rewards. 
So that would be, if you really want me to take a shower, you're going to have to give me a cup of ice cream, and then I'll do it. And um, so you could see that that, isn't, that works as long as you have something you might want to offer, but, but that person isn't really internalizing that. The other one is internal rewards. So that's where I, I, have, the, I have the motivation. I'm the one uh, who uh, understands that um, with, uh, uh, for example, if something is really of a great value to me, then, then I'm going to internalize that. I'm going to be the one who's going to be deciding it. Uh, if I, for example, uh, believe in working with pe persons with disabilities is a good thing, uh, nobody really has to tell me that. That's, gonna, that's mine. I own it. So, um, both of the, so you really want to know, okay, if you can get to internal rewards, that's, wh that's what you'd want as, a, as the motivation. Two different types of uh, social skills. And if you were to sign someone up for a program, you'd want to know what type that provider is offering. Uh, the first one is called instrumental skills. This is where it's pretty much a lot of scripted work. Uh, you know, you're, you're teaching someone how to greet someone, how to say hello and goodbye, uh, how to be polite. All those things are, are, are very important. But it's not going to get you into a friendship, actually. Uh, it's basically going to help you out just be able to fit into society. The other kind, and the, that's the kind that I work on, are relationship skills. And the thing with relationship skills is that you really, a way for someone to, be, to have a relationship, to have a friendship with someone, is that they really have to be able to read them, to read all of their social, their social cues. And, um, and so that you, they pretty much get into the other person's head. So, okay, so anyway, relationship uh, skills. If you could think about if you've ever gone on a blind date. Now, I've gone on maybe two, and uh, I probably don't want to go on anymore, by the way. <laughs> but uh, blind dates, if you sort of think about it, it's really like me, you know, thinking about you, thinking about me, thinking about you. <laughs> and we don't even have to say anything. But before that date, I'm going to be worried about how I'm coming across, how I'm um, communicating, what you're going to think of me. So I'm not only worried about my signals that I'm going to put out, I'm worried about yours too. And that gets into, into social cognition. And this is really the core of issues with persons with intellectual disabilities, is that um, they're not, they're, um, uh, they're pretty much operating as, uh, as an individual person without getting it that I really have to, the way that I need to connect with someone is to try to understand what they're thinking. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people with disabilities think that all I have to do is just start talking and then we're going to be friends. And of course, there's a lot more to it than that. So it's really moving the person from an I perspective, just a me perspective, to an us perspective. Okay. There's two kinds of problems that you usually see with it. One is the social perceptual problems, and the other one is communication difficulties. And those come under the realm of the social cognition. So social uh, perceptual, that's really the reading other people, noticing, interpreting uh, their social cues, empathizing. So how do we get somebody to do that? Well, one of the first ways is what we're, what we're really trying to do is to teach them how to pay attention, how to um, pay attention to the other person, to their surroundings. And I'm, uh, throughout working with them, I'm going to be uh, having them looking at another person's expressions, looking at another person's posture, how close are they to you in proximity, how loud are they speaking, all of those things. Uh, which does not really include the content of what they're saying. It's really the nonverbal language, and that's, that's what I really emphasize, that someone really needs to learn that. So, okay, so what's the person really trying to tell me? You know, that's, that's what you're going through. Um, that's where you're going with that. Uh, I use different things, you know, different, you know, charades and stuff. Might have like a picture of all different expressions or different body language. And, and especially when I'm working in a group, we'll have a lot of fun with that. Um, also, you know, watching videos with the sound off is another way of, of uh, trying to uh, get someone to only look at nonverbal. So, okay, but one of the big problems that I see that comes up is a person will um, uh, just listen to what the other person is saying. They give more stock to that than they do the nonverbal. 
So if someone says to you, you know, I really like you and let's have lunch and blah, 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 and actually they're sort of walking away from you as they're saying that and they're not looking at you anymore, uh, the actual message that anyone else could read if they could read social cues is like this person is just sort of blowing you off. A person with disabilities, says they don't see it like that. They basically say, okay, I'm going to be having lunch with this person and I'll call them up. So, uh, so it's very important to know the difference and um, also asking uh, the individual that when you start to see someone back off from you, when they're not looking at you, um, and despite, doesn't, don't even think about listening to what their words are, the message is that they're, they're pulling away. Another one is I uh, suggest that people, uh, just as a tip, to sort of also learning to try to learn what the other person is thinking. Look at their eyes. Where are they looking? Uh, it's probably what they're thinking about. And uh, especially if a person is uh, actively looking at their watch while they're talking to you. The, the message is probably that they need to get out of there for some reason. And so uh, looking at cues and being aware of that is going to be really essential. Okay, there's one very cool uh, uh, tip that someone gave me. And um, so, so what it is, uh, because eye contact is a big deal. Everyone wants to have, have you offer eye contact to them. Um, so what it is is basically if you were to look at another person and look at like this space right between their eyebrows, and that, if you look there, it actually looks as if you're giving the other person eye contact. We tried it in the group and it absolutely works, so something to offer. Okay, so social cognition is successful when the person is really able, you know, to put all those, uh, that information together and to come up with basically an educated guess. So, okay, now the other thing is also learning from other people very, very important because relationships are a two-way street. If you talk to someone and they tell you maybe they're going for a graduate degree or something, and um, the next time you see them, I would suggest that you ask them about how their degree is going. <laughs> so learning about the other person gives the other person the, the idea that this person's really interested. Gee, they actually listen to me. When someone feels that they've been listened to, that they feel cared about and they feel that you're engaging with them, that you want to invest some time with them. We have a, um, I have a fun little game that I play, and, and again, when I do social skills, I pretty much will do them in groups. So the, the game is basically everyone gets a, an index card, and they are asked to go around the group and ask people something interesting about them. Could they tell them something interesting about them or something fun? Uh, they write down, and they go to each person and get that information. Then at the end of it, they all get together and each person will introduce the next person using that information. And, uh, and it's a, a fun activity, a, you know, lots of people really enjoy it and, and they find out about each other. But so it's important because they're finding out about each other, but we then go into why is it important to find out about each other? Why is it so important to get information about the other person? And the basic thing is that is when you ask me maybe a month or so down the road something I've told you today and you ask me about it, then I'm really, I'm like, oh, I'm pretty impressed with that. This person was actually listening. And then I'm even going to go further and just say they actually care about me to do that. So, but we also have to watch for the, um, you know, we can't just ask questions of everyone without taking into account the roles that that person would play in your life. So for example, um, I wouldn't be asking a, someone who delivered me uh, some, a, a box or something to my door who's a stranger to me, um, it's the same types of questions that I might be asking my sister with regard to the box. So I might be asking him something like, well, um, oh, is this your last delivery of the day? Or <laughs> something very innocuous. And whereas with my sister, I might say, yeah, I, I received this box and it was a real surprise and this is a present for your daughter and, and, uh, and I'm so excited about going to the party with her. You know, so I'm, I'm certainly sharing a lot more. Now, if you notice there, there's also, um, friend is also one of the relationships. People with intellectual disabilities always have an issue between um, what is the difference between being friendly 
and being a friend. So, uh, and so basically they could easily walk into a post office and because that person has been talking to them, suddenly that's their friend. And so we have lots of conversations around that. What does it mean to be, to have a friend? What does it mean uh, for that relationship? What does that look like? Um, and so that's gonna bring about some conversations with regard to boundaries in relationships. So how I, how I help them sort of see what, what the, uh, the differences are, are um, we're basically gonna say, well, well, how close are you to that person? So there's the category of either you're a stranger, you're an acquaintance, you're a friend, and then there's the other dimension, which is how close are you to that person? So I'll have them go through these four uh, different dimensions, and, uh, and I'll have them rate it from zero to four, zero meaning uh, no and, or never, and four meaning the most. And like one of them might be, uh, how much do you and this person share in terms of common interest? We, we'll do that with several of the people in their life, and they're a lot of times very surprised because they think, well, gee, I thought my parent was, uh, was the closest one to me. But, and, but in actuality, it may be someone that they're um, working, uh, a coworker. So it's sort of when, and the idea is, is the closer you are to someone, the more personal you can get in the questions that you might be asking them or talking to them about or um, uh, sharing with them. The further, the less close you are with someone, then the less personal the questions or the sharing would be. Very, it's very important to do that. So, okay, so the other, the other deficit, cognitive, uh, social cognition deficit, uh, besides perceptual, is just communication. So, uh, you know, and it's a, it's a huge problem because uh, persons who are uh, talking with them uh, don't really get it that this person probably has a slow processing speed. So that means you may ask them a question. Staff, this is what I hear a lot. Staff will ask a person a question and the person will just sort of not answer them. And then the staff will complain to me and they'll say, well, I don't understand, I'm talking to them, I, you know, until, until I'm blue in the face and the person just looks at me. So what I, I'm gonna coach the staff into understanding that that person has very slow processing speed. And I may say to them, why don't you just do like a countdown on them? Because everyone's processing speed is a little bit different. So I'll say a count 1,001, just to yourself, 1,002, 1,003, and then when that person answers, that's the, that's the amount of space you have to give them every time that you're talking with them. And um, it, makes, it makes a big difference, you know, with the staff. And they sort of understand, because they were thinking that the person was just being rude and not paying attention to them at all. Uh, the other thing is that they're, they're um, very, uh, they're talking concrete terms, um, not really understanding things, uh, not uh, jokes sort of go way past them. Uh, take, they take everything, a lot of things at face value. Now, again, when I'm talking about persons with disabilities, there's a wide spectrum. So some people may have a lot of this going on, some people just have a little bit of it going on. But when you see it, it's all, it's related to the intellectual disability. Okay, and sometimes they, well a lot of the times actually, they even have, even people with very good vocabulary. So I'm talking about persons on, on the high functioning autism level. They, uh, they don't know when to join a conversation. They don't know when to, they don't have reciprocal conversation skills. They don't know turn taking. So with that, we'll have an exercise where, where I'm gonna have a ball and the idea is, is that whenever I have the ball, I can talk. And then I'm gonna throw it, then I'll throw it to the, the other person and then when he or she has the ball, that's when he can talk. And I remember one fellow I work with where, where he was someone who never took into account that, that conversation is a reciprocal two-way street. So whenever I would talk, he would literally have his arms out, almost like holding onto the ball again, like n didn't want to let it go. Okay, Karen Harvey. Karen Harvey is um, a, one of, has been one of the presenters on this series, and I have to tell you, I absolutely love her work. I love her work because she talks about uh, the person's identity and how they see themselves. And one of the things that she says is like a lot of times people identify themselves as the problem. 
you know, rather than a person who enjoys, um, I don't know, bowling or uh, arts and crafts or whatever, they identify themselves as a problem. That's a horrible way to, uh, to be, be interacting with the world. If you, if you really think that, you're, all your interactions are going to go in that direction. Um, now, I want to tell you just about a little story about myself. When, uh, when uh, I've been involved in the disability field ever since pretty much I learned my daughter was disabled. I can remember, and I was in all kinds of different committees, and I can remember being on one of those committees and one of the people who was on it um, uh, said to me, you know, why is it that whenever I talk to a parent who has a disabled child, all I hear about is what the child did wrong, like what's wrong with them? And I just looked at her and I said, well, you're not talking about me, are you? And she said, yeah. <laughs> and I was just bowled over and I just uh, couldn't, I said, oh my God, that's the way I'm raising my daughter so that all she knows about herself is what's wrong with her. And uh, so that one interaction with that one person totally changed the way I looked at my daughter, that totally changed the way I interacted with her and also acts almost like as a filter for as, as I went on with my career, started working with families with uh, disabilities, I began to help parents really see all the positives that are out are about their children. And the positive always outweighs any of the negative stuff. But not for anything, but uh, it's, it's easy for parents to come to this because they're always taking their child to doctors and then they're always talking about what's wrong. So, um, so, so they sort of combine it naturally, but uh, it's something that really, uh, it's once, once you sort of get it that your, your child has got so much more going for them, so much more to offer the world, then you're going to be looking at them a lot differently. When you change the way you think about something, you're going to change the way you feel about it, and then you change the way you behave. Okay, now I get to my group. Um, I have to tell you that a lot of the things that, are, that I've been talking about today, they're not really original ideas with me. I wish I could say they were, but they're not. But what I did with this, with my group, is that I just put together all kinds of things that I've learned over the years. This group it meets every Thursday, and it goes on forever. It lasts for an hour. It has uh, there's eight participants in it, and it has three phases to it. And the first one is pretty much what you would call think of as a check-in. You know, how would how did your week go? Do you have any issues that you want to talk about? Um, and But the way that this check-in is done um, is a little bit different than typical check-ins. Uh, typical check-ins for groups with intellectual disabilities, that w what you usually get is the person will talk about whatever's going on with them, but then everyone else in the room is they're looking up, they're looking around, you know, they're looking maybe at their phone, <laughs> and giving all the signals that they're just not interested. Um, what uh, there's a, uh, a wonderful psychologist by the name of uh, Dan Tomasula, works out of New Jersey, my home state. And he came up with this cognitive networking, recognizing that persons with disabilities have pretty much been taught to, uh, to not regard themselves. And also to, and especially not, because they don't believe anyone is listening to them. And they don't listen to anyone else. And they especially don't regard each other. So how, how this works basically is the person will talk a little bit about how their week went, what they're concerned about. I will then stop them and we then ask the group, you know, who was listening? Who can tell us what uh, Marx just said? And uh, so uh, after one or two sessions of doing that, Believe me, the group, the group definitely listens because they, they probably get a little bit embarrassed if they haven't been listening. They're sort of almost, you know, maybe they feel that they're being called out. So it works great because the person who is sharing the information is now really being listened to. The person will, uh, uh, you know, uh, share what he's heard and then the person who has been delivering the information, you know, really gets it that, okay, you really care about me. So it's a wonderful experience and it really highlights the whole group. And, um, okay. And the second part is mindfulness. Now mindfulness, uh, I use that almost as a break between the, uh, the initial social networking and the skills training. 
the mindfulness is basically, it's maybe like a five minute, five to 10 minute exercise, if that. And we're gonna sort of be taking a break so that we're uh, just uh, uh, feeling that and, and understanding that when you're in a relationship, you really need to be present with the other person. If you're, really, if you're sitting there and all you're thinking about is the next thing you're gonna say, that other person picks that up. Now, sometimes that's necessary, right, in some circumstances, but in social relationships where you wanna make a friendship, you really wanna be present to the other person, and mindfulness helps you do that. The third phase of the group is what I call skill building. Now remember, I'm only doing, this is a 60 minute group, so it goes by very, very quickly. And, but this is also sort of a fun part of it because here I'm going to be maybe pulling out different videos that I have, different, I have different games, I have different books, I have all kinds of skill building stuff. And uh, we might focus on something that came up during the initial part, during that check-in part. Uh, or we might be talking about how to recognize social cues and what that's all about. But whenever we're doing any of this, we're um, uh, really uh, you know, thinking about, well, what do you think about this? Have you ever done this? Uh, have you seen anyone else do it? And so we're gonna have lots of conversations uh, before we actually go into maybe practicing it with role play. So the person feels very uh, informed about whatever we're talking about, and uh, that may actually take a couple of sessions before we go into a role play. I love the idea of talking to people about small talk. Small talk is a big deal. Small talk is one of those things where it sort of, it indicates to me and to the other person that we're sort of safe with each other, that you're not gonna kill me or anything. <laughs> so, um, so engaging in small talk is a way to, is an entree into a conversation. Even with, even with good friends, right? Talking about the weather, some sports team that you're just on, whatever. Um, uh, so we'll do that. We'll, we'll, I'll ask them to maybe to, before they come to group, look at maybe the news or whatever, or th listen to whatever their family is saying and bring that information into the group. But, but we're also engaging in reciprocal conversation too with the small talk. And then there's another thing I use. It's um, a couple of books that uh, were written about the hitting curriculum. Okay, so what's the hitting curriculum? Well, those are the rules that are definitely in our society, and these are things that you know you just sort of pick up over the years. Nobody really tells you. You may have seen what happens if somebody sort of breaks these hidden rules, uh, but it's people with disabilities, a lot of them, they really don't know a lot of this, the, the hidden rules of society. So um, here's one from uh, one of the books, and they, they'll go into, this particular book will go into, it's actually working with people who are in jobs, and they, it sort of goes into all different situations that they may be in, being on an airplane, bathroom rules, behavior in movie theaters, and uh, so we'll talk about all this. And I love this, the one that they did on bathroom rules was great. Um, you know, things again that, that maybe you need to be told. Uh, and one of them is, okay, always close the door when you're using the restroom, okay? Uh, and I love this one, you know, pull up your pants before you're coming out of the stall. And believe it or not, <laughs> some people actually have to be told that. So, and once they're told these things, they're, you know, sort of a light bulb goes off. Well, I didn't know that. I had one person who went to a birthday party, and it was a birthday party with other adults with disabilities, and they didn't know why the host was so angry at them when it came time to blow out the candles. He blew out this person's birthday candles. So it was like one of those rules. Nobody does that. Or you, or you, it's one of those things where you say, you know, that's obvious. You should have known better than that. Uh, another th um, item, uh, sort of a technique that I use is about, the, it's called social behavior mapping. So uh, this is about helping a person understand how their behavior is impacting others. And, and it also is about how their behavior makes others, other people feel about themselves. So the way that uh, Michelle Garcia Winner has, like, has put this out is she calls it expected behavior versus unexpected behavior, which I like. It's not about this is good behavior or this is bad behavior, because that puts a level of shame on things. But if you think of it in terms of, well, what's expected? You know, if you go to 
a movie, whatever, what's expected of you? Uh, or what's unexpected if you just start jumping up and down at a movie? That wouldn't really work. So I'll use a whiteboard and we'll use, we'll put down the behavior and then we'll talk about it. You know, so I may say, well, an expected behavior if I'm on an airplane would be I, to sit in my assigned seat. And how it makes others feel? Well, it makes them feel calm. They're, they feel cool about this. Um, they have good thoughts about me. Unexpected behavior would be if I sat in a seat that was not assigned to me. Now, all of us have been on an airplane where we've, where we've seen that. And pretty much most of us will feel very annoyed when that happens. And most people will then, they will then have like not so good thoughts about you. And then you're not gonna feel good. So, but the thing with uh, expected behavior and unexpected behavior is that it's very much connected to the context and also the age of the person. Uh, for example, if I start, if I start yelling and jumping up and down, well, that's okay if I'm at a football game. If I start yelling and jumping up and down and I'm in the boardroom, that's not okay. <laughs> that's not gonna go over. So it's not really the behavior as much as it is where it happens, where it occurs. Uh, this one is about someone cutting up your food. Okay, so if you're a two-year-old, it's expected that you would cut someone's food up, cut that person's food up. If the person is 20 and you're still cutting up their food, that's unexpected, also considered as a little bit weird. Uh, if, however, you're physically unable to do it, then it would be expected behavior that someone might cut up your food. But it's not all about how uh, you're thinking about everyone else. You also want, you're also in, in the relationship too. So people really need to get to know you too. Uh, you need to be able to express your needs and desires. And a lot of that causes a lot of anxiety for persons with disabilities. They get, uh, they worry about it. Then they sometimes also get into negative self-talk uh, saying, well, if I tell that person that I want them to stop doing something, they're not gonna like me anymore. So what the, the, the gist is is that we're saying, well, if you want a relationship, you really have to share some of yourself with someone. That's the only way you're gonna get a relationship. If they don't know anything about you, then they're not going to have a, anything uh, to connect with you on. So you really, and some things you're going to, it's much better if you start to tell a little bit more about yourself, become a little bit more vulnerable. Uh, communication tools, well, it, it's not, a lot of times I may even, even have to coach a person even how to have a conversation. You know, turn taking, um, if that person is uh, only talking about themselves, like the fellow who talks about the fossils all the time. Okay, if he's only talking about themselves, as interesting as that is about the fossils, they're not giving the message of, okay, well, what, what are you interested in? What, would, what are the kinds of things that you like to do in your spare time? And I'm asking them to also to listen to that person, but uh, to also stay on topic. Because if that person says something and then you just go right back to your fossils, well, you're not really listening or you don't really care about me. There, is, um, there are two um, people who have uh, worked in DBT, Dialectical Behavior Therapy, and they've modified it to work with persons with disabilities. One, if you know DBT, you'll know that it consists of a number of modules that they work on. One of them is called relationship effectiveness. And it's generally about helping a person be assertive, helping a person be able to say no to someone, um, helping a person be able to express their needs. And then, of course, we're also going to do some role plays with that. But again, I'm always going to do a whole ton of background conversation. Um, uh, have you ever seen that before? Have you done that before? And before I'm ever going to ask anyone to do a role play, because the role plays can be difficult with things that are hard for you. Uh, they, uh, in the DBT, they also have like this four-step formula about how to express your needs. I came across these talking blocks a couple of years ago, and they're terrific, and they're not all that expensive. I got them on the internet, and I have them in the bibliography for you to reference. But talking blocks are, they, it's basically six blocks, and each, each block has got all different sides of the block, 
uh, they'll have, uh, what is it, the, the red blocks, I think, talk about like your feelings. And then there's blue blocks, which also suggest different things that you could do about those feelings. Why is that important? Well, often uh, when I ask someone, you know, how they're feeling, can you, can you tell me about how you're feeling today or whatever? You know, well, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> so there's, so it, I lay those blocks out and I have the person, you know, look at them. There's a word on there that might say angry and then there's a picture of someone who's angry. So they're able to even crystallize in their own head as to, and clarify actually how they're feeling. And it sort of, it helps them to identify their own feelings, even to themselves. And then the other set of blocks is basically saying, okay, so if you feel angry, what do you need to do? And there's um, however many solutions on there. It might be talk to somebody, uh, leave the room, listen to music. So I'll have them go through all of those. And what I'm really hoping they do is to maybe pick out one or two different uh, coping mechanisms or coping strategies that they could use. There is a wonderful product that I definitely recommend people to get, and it's through YAI. YAI uh, is an organization from New York City. They do tons of work with people with disabilities, group homes, and all kinds of supported uh, vocational things, and, and they put out a lot of products. And this one is the one that I found to be most, most uh, helpful in helping people understand about social skills and what to look for. What I especially like about them is that they'll use actors who actually have IDD so that the group that you're working with really resonates with the kinds of issues that the, those scenarios will bring up. Um, things about bossiness, self-centeredness, entitlement. Uh, they even go through the whole, all the differences between strangers, acquaintances, and friends. So we have, an, well, I'm, I'm gonna be able to use those maybe for, oh gosh, at least 10 sessions. And, pe and the people uh, are able, they have lots of conversation about it. And you also get to see the uh, array of different uh, perspectives that people are taking and uh, which will sometimes surprise you. Sometimes you see someone who's, who has ID and you think that they are very, very high functioning until you start to hear how they're interpreting these scenarios. Lots of other tools that I use. Um, I use the incredible five-point scale, which helps a person be able to modulate or, uh, or identify how they're feeling. Um, and for example, a one is, you know, they're feeling, you know, pretty calm about things. Uh, whereas as you start to go up the scale to maybe a three, you're starting to get agitated. Uh, and of course, when you go up to a five, now you're, you're full blown out of control. So once they, they start to sort of notice how they're feeling about things, how, um, you know, either they're starting to, their stomach starts to bother them, they're starting to get tense and maybe that's like at a three. And that's the point where they can then say, I need some help. And then you can also redirect them. Uh, there are two things that I use that I really love using, and one of them is uh, Carol Gray's Comic Strip Conversations, and the other one is Preparing for Life, a, a picture book with, by Dr. Jed Baker. And both of these are picture books that will give you the opportunity to sort of, to look at what you're saying and so I'll, I'll bring them out and maybe one of the group people will uh, say something that has happened to them, that they said something to someone and they don't really understand what the person, why the person walked away. So we'll, it's like two characters and, and uh, two bubbles and the one bubble will be, I will put in whatever that person said and then the other bubble is left blank. So I'm basically gonna be offering this to the group, thinking, okay, what does everyone think that this person is, is probably thinking when you did so-and-so? So it's a great instructional tool, and, um, and it really helps a person start to take perspective of someone else. Taking perspective of someone else is one of the biggest problems uh, that I see with persons with ID. They pretty much often think that the, that the world revolves around them, uh, but, and they think everyone thinks the way they think. So you can imagine that's gonna cause a lot of problems uh, when you're working with people. Okay, now typically most of my work is done with groups. Most of my social skills, relationship skill building is done in groups. I think that's the best way to do it. Uh, but not everybody is gonna want to do a group. 
Uh, I've had people in groups before that I thought would do very well and come to find out that they just didn't feel comfortable enough in the group and they wanted to work with me one-on-one. -on -one. So I can do that too. So how we do it is I am going to spend a lot of time with that person, helping them, uh, especially with Karen Harvey's work, you know, do some positive identity work with them, which is all about like helping their self-esteem, identifying areas that they truly are talented in and are gifted in. So I'll spend a number of sessions building my relationship with them, and then we're going to start to talk about like friendships and what friendships mean to them. Uh, you know, people who don't have friendships, uh, I, I'll see it in my initial intake, where uh, we're talking about you know, going through their medical history and, and, and uh, psychiatric history or whatever. But then when we get up to their social life, they're almost very embarrassed to say, I really don't have any friends. And so you're, this is where you're going to really hear all about that um, and how they feel about it, what they uh, would like to see, um, how they think their life could change. Or a lot of times you sort of, you get that they're almost hopeless about it. So. And then I'm going to go into going back to sharing, you know, some of the wonderful things that I see, that I see about them, and um, the potential that um, uh, that they could of future experiences with friends that they could have. But I will also probably mention something about uh, maybe one little thing that I may see that might help them. It's off, very often about perspective taking. Uh, turn taking in relation in friend in relationships, and I'll reference our own maybe last four or five sessions, you know, in terms of this is what I'm experiencing when I'm with you. But it might just be one thing. That's all I'm going to talk about. But that's after I've built a good relationship, after they trust me, hopefully, and that, then they're able to hear it. They're able to hear it. If I just all of a sudden came in there and said, you know what, you really need to work on so and so. They've already, they're already coming in feeling bad. So that sort of cements it. So, so I don't want to do that. I want them to feel really good about themselves. And then we're going to mention something. At the same time, um, it's still up to them what they want to work on. So what they choose to work on is, is where we're going to start. Wherever they are, whatever they find is the most um, compelling thing for them to start with. That's, that's where we're going to start. So. So I'm going to help them understand um, through that whole process, understand what a, what a friendship is and how people feel when you treat them with respect and when you treat them uh, in a way that is, uh, you know, caring about them, how that makes that other person feel. This isn't about changing anyone's personality. We don't want to do any of that. This is really about how do you observe your environment so that uh, you're able to connect with someone else. It's really about how do you connect with people. And, but the primary thing is, is so much of it is about gaining perspective of other people. So social is complicated. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of things that, that we're talking about that we have to learn. Um, you know, there's um, stuff about social cues, uh, social cognition, hitting curriculum, uh, internal rewards, external rewards. Uh, small talk, there's all kinds of stuff that uh, is involved with this. So it really is a big field. And to sort of end here, I'd like to just say that friendship truly is, in my mind, and the persons that I work with so for the past number of years, it's the missing piece. It's the missing piece that's sort of not dealt with. It's uh, almost avoided by some providers because they um, they just sort of feel, well, that's, that's the person and they're not going to make any changes. And in my mind, my experience has been when you start to talk about these things, you start to talk about how other people um, uh, are in relationships, um, how you can uh, start to uh, observe the other person, how you can start to understand where they're coming from, that uh, your life is just going to get bigger. Um, that they are more than willing to make the change. They really want this. And uh, you have the ability to uh, offer them several strategies and opportunities to be able to make very little changes sometimes, and, but it could really make all the difference. So again, one change might make all the difference, and um, I'm hoping that you got something out of this presentation 
and that um, you can appreciate the value of friendship for persons with intellectual disabilities. Thank you.